right, so 1 Samuel chapter number 24, and if you remember last week in our story, David had uh, taken shelter and, and been betrayed by uh, the Ziphites, and had gone and delivered, after he delivered the city of, uh, I can't remember its name right off the top of my head, but he went and he fought off those Philistines, and we, we kind of closed last week talking about the irony that it, what it was that, um, you know, David's the one that goes and beats, beats up the Philistines, and then Saul's the one that's got to go and deal with it. And then, of course, it starts there in the beginning of the chapter where Saul's come back from having to deal with that. In verse 24, as it said, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 men, chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So we see that Saul is still very resolved to pursue David and probably because he's thinking that his cause is just. You know, Saul is convinced in his mind that he's going to continue to reign, that he's going to defeat David, and that Jonathan, his son, is going to take over the throne after him. And if you remember back in chapter 23, if you want to turn back there real quick, you can see that this is the attitude that he has, that he's on the right side of things and that he's going to be successful. It says in verse 7, it was told Saul, uh, was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, uh, Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. So he's saying, aha, you know, God's delivered him into my hand. He's thinking, God has delivered him into my hand. So he thinks that God is on his side, that this is going to be a successful mission, coming back from defeating the Philistines, and he's going to take these guys on. And we see that Saul, as of course, that leads him to be very careless, in his pursuit. He's so confident that he's going to win that he becomes very careless and that's kind of how he gets himself in this predicament in verse 3. It says there in verse 3, and, it came to, and, and he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave and Saul went in to cover his feet and David and his men remained in the sides. So Saul's go down there and he, and he gets himself in this position there and of course I'm not going to go into this exactly what all this means but he goes in to cover his feet, and that's a euphemism for, you know, uh, relieving oneself, which is a euphemism for, if you don't know, your parents can tell you later, <laughs> okay? I'll let them deal with that. But, uh, and people, it's funny when people want to debate that. People actually make that a point in their sermons. Like, well, you know, that's something, you know, it, you know I'm going to just go off here, okay? Uh, this is in my notes, but peop, it's just so stupid, the people, the things that people go after that Pastor Anderson has taught. You know, Pastor Anderson teaches that's what this means, and they, they got to go after every single thing and, and just, you know, be contrary in every single way that they can. And they go, well, that doesn't mean what it means. It means he went in there and he, it, covering his feet, you know, covering feet just means he's taking a nap, folks. That's what it means. Yeah, that's why he took his robe off to do it, right? Because when you take a nap, you take clothes off and, you, you know, you're going to get cold, so it makes sense you take your robe off. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about that. That's what I believe. You know, if you have a different opinion, that's fine. You know, that you can have a different opinion about it. But the point is this. It just shows you that Saul has become, you know, so confident that he's going to win, that he's become this careless. Where he's just, I'm going to go into this cave alone and just, you know, be alone. And I, who can blame him for wanting to be alone in a moment like that? I understand that. But, you know, it's careless. You know, and, and what, it is, what it happens is it leaves him giving David you know, uh, a, a, a better position, you know. Uh, and, and really, this, calls, this all comes from Saul's false confidence, you know, and this false confidence comes from the fact that, you know, he gets into this position because Saul thinks David's in another place. He's not thinking, well, David might be in this cave, because if you notice there, it says, you know, he, 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 he was on his way to the, the, the uh, he says, behold, David is in the wilderness and, and Jedi. Look at verse 2, and it says, and David and his men, uh, it went to seek David and his men upon the rock, rocks of the wild goats. So what's going on here is Saul's acting on bad intelligence, right? He's, if you remember with the uh, Ziphites back in chapter 23, I won't take the time to read all that, um, but they did say, you know, hey, he kind of makes a league with them, and he says, you know, if Saul, you find out where his haunt is, if anyone know where he is, you tell me if, where he has been seen, I'm going to come and, and get him. So he's acting on this intelligence that he's gotten because it says there it came to pass when Saul was returned from the following of the Philistines. It was told him, saying, Behold, David. So he's not, it's not that he knows for sure David's there. He's just assuming that's where David is. So he becomes very careless and he ends up in this cave 
with not just David, but all his men. And David has 400 men with him. And David uh, and Saul ends up, you know, putting himself in a very vulnerable position. So he's delivered into the hands of David right here in verse 3. And it says, and, it, and when, the she, when he came to the sheep coats by the way, and that's, these, de 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 these details are important, okay, in chapters, uh, verses 3. There's, we're going to get into that here in a minute. Notice it says, and he came to uh, the sheep coats by the way where was a cave. So he's on his way to where he thinks David is, right? Because, you know, he's by the way, which is, you know, like being in the way. It's on the way. It's by the way. This isn't where he thinks David is. He's on his way to where he thinks David is. And he comes by the sheep goats and he goes in and he overcomes his feet. And it says, and David and his men at the end of verse three remained in the sides of the cave. So this is probably a real big cave. You got to think about how does he keep 400 men in there? You know, you start to read the story and you start to think these details through and you go, well, how did they have this conversation without Saul hearing? You know, how, how did Saul not notice 400 men in the cave? It's probably a very big cave. You know, and the Bible doesn't take the time to give us all these details. Not only this story, but in others, because of the fact that that would just make bad reading. You know, and the Bible's thick enough as it is. You know, I love the fact that God gives us just enough details to kind of figure things out for ourselves. And I think that's something that we'll see is important here later in the, in the chapter as well. But it's a very big cave, and he's, uh, you know, he's in there with 400 men, and they're probably whispering. And maybe there's one guy out by the cave who sees Saul coming, and he goes back and tells everybody to hide. And then he kind of comes in, and, and Saul puts his robe somewhere, and David's in the right spot, and just kind of cut the, the, the skirt of the robe off. <coughs> but, uh, you know, this all is because of the fact that Saul has become just so confident in the fact that he's going to win this victory. And really, if you would, go over to Psalms chapter 57, because this whole scenario that plays out is actually an answer to David's prayer. David prayed actually a couple prayers that are recorded in the Psalms um, around this time, both when, before he went into the cave and after. So in Psalms chapter 57, if you, does everybody's Psalms have the little title at the top there? If you read that, it says, To the chief musician, I won't pronounce those names, of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave, okay? So when he fled from Saul in the cave. So I believe what this is saying is the fact when he, you know, he knew Saul was kind of coming on the way to, to get him, so he's fleeing to the cave, okay? And he prays this prayer. He says, you know, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings I will make my refuge until, thy, uh, until these calamities be passed over. I will cry unto the most high God. So this whole, you can read this, you can take the time to read all this, but this is a prayer that David actually prayed before he went into that, you know, when he was fleeing from Saul into this cave. And you know what? God delivers him, you know, and he's saying, you know, he's crying out to God, he's asking God for mercy. And he says in verse four, my soul is among lions and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above all the heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared an, a net for my, uh, my steps. Look at verse 7. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory. Awake psaltery and harp. I will wake my safe early. So he goes on just you know, praising the Lord for his mercy. He's, so you can tell that David, you know, he's trusting God. You might want to keep something in Psalms, by the way. And this is an answer to David's prayer. So and, you know, prayer works. And what we see play out here, and I just want to make three points tonight, is, is three things. One, that... David's reasons or his motives are right. Okay, David is the guy who's in the right in this story. He's the one with the right motives. He's the right one with the right intentions. His reasons, his motives are right. And if you look there, you know, uh, in the story, um, you know, David's men, they kind of seen this as an opportunity for David to exact revenge, to finally take Saul. I mean, and it is. I mean, it's, you couldn't ask for a more ideal situation for David. He's in there with all 400 men. Saul's completely by himself, okay? You don't take guys in there with you when you're doing, doing this, right? This is a very private moment. So his men, and I believe, we'll see here in a minute, I believe his men are actually even further away. That, that this isn't the only time in the story where David kind of has Saul cornered, okay? But he's got him, I mean, this is the ideal moment for, for David to just strike, to just take Saul out. And his men see it, and of course David sees it. You know, and this is, but David's been praying and asking God for mercy. God, he's been asking God to lead him. And, and we can learn a lot about this from David. It, it, the fact that he's not willing to do this. You know, he will not touch the Lord's anointed. 
That's a very important thing. And I, and I know we talked about that recently in, you know, in other chapters. You know, we can apply that to ourselves, we being the anointed of God. You know, if we're saved, we're anointed. You know, that applies to us. But, you know, especially more so we could apply it to even people that are in leadership, like pastors and such, that, you know, they also are the Lord's anointed, you know. And it, it, and it never ceases to amaze me when you see people that are, you know, are trying to bring harm or harass or persecute or vex, you know, one of God's anointed. Like, oh, I don't know, our pastor? <laughs> and, you know, and like he said last night in his sermon, he, he freely admits that he's just a man like anybody else. But I was thinking about this before he even preached that, because I've been reading this chapter, you know, and, and thinking about this, and because and, that's what Saul's doing in this chapter. He is persecuting the Lord's anointed, because remember, David's the Lord's anointed too. He's been anointed. He's the next to the line of the throne. And, you know, when you have a guy like Pastor Anderson, who's had so much influence. I mean, think about all the just, I mean, how many people would you even think he got, he's gotten saved just through his online ministry? Just through, just through, I mean, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, I don't know. Only heaven will tell. I mean, he's literally getting people saved in his sleep from the videos that are out there. He goes to bed at night and somebody's watching a documentary on the other side of the world and gets saved. You know, and, and, and he, so he has this profound influence, the preaching that has changed so many lives, the church that he's built, that God has built through him, rather, and has, you know, he's availed himself to that and paid that price and gone through the persecutions that he's gone through. I mean, what I'm getting at is that he has a tremendous influence for the Lord. And then you see people come along and backstab him and, and meddle with him and mess with him. And it's no wonder when later in life, when, you know, down the road, they get confounded. Right? Like was preached last night. I'm not going to re-preach that. But, you know, that's a good principle that we can learn from that. David's motives are the ones that are right. And when his men saw an opportunity to kill Saul, what David saw was a test. Right? What's really going on here is God is testing him. Notice there in verse 4 it says, And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of the Lord, excuse me, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. So if this is indeed what the Lord said unto David, did it say he's going to deliver him into his hand so that he could smite him and take his place? Or did he say, I'll deliver him in your hand that, so that you may do as seemeth good unto thee? So it's kind of like God is testing him here. And you have to think about, you know, why didn't David just kill him? You know, why didn't David just put an end to this and just be done with it? It's obviously Saul's just rotten to the core and just wants to, to kill David. Right? Why didn't he take this advantage of this opportunity? Well, one, you know, that probably would have invalidated him to a lot of people, if you think about it. I mean, just think about it, you know, practically speaking, kind of like on a politics type of thing. You know, they'd say it's a, it was a rigged election, right? They would say, those votes don't count. He killed him, right? You know, they would, they would throw a fit. They would say everyone that sided, because remember, people still sided with Saul. Remember when uh, uh, his son uh, rose up and, and chased him out? What was that guy's name that was kicking rocks at him and calling him a son of Belial? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. You know what I'm talking about, though, right? And he's cursing David. And he, one of the curses that he says is, you know, uh, he, he says that, you know, God, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, is that God is revisiting all the, the blood of Saul upon him. That's what, it, that's what he accuses him. So people, even that late into David's reign, still had a soft spot for Saul. So if, if David had kind of taken matters in his own hands, politically speaking, it probably wouldn't have been a smart thing. You know, the 3,000 men that are down there probably would have, wouldn't have just joined sides. They might have killed David, you know. And it really, it lends itself to the fact that it, it validates David later. You know, when, when, uh, when Saul finally kills himself and David takes the throne. And even after that, it still takes seven years for all of Israel to follow David. So you can see why it was probably a, bet, a good thing that he didn't touch the Lord's anointed. Aside from the fact that, you know, the Bible says, you know, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. That's just something that the Lord said not to do. So David is really actually being tested here. And, you know, it's a compelling reason not to touch the Lord's anointed because he's kind of thinking, well, I'm the Lord's anointed. And I see what God's doing to Saul. So Saul's kind of a perfect example of why not to do it, if that makes sense. But I want to just kind of point out some things because really, you know, what he's, what's going on here is David is being tested to do right, right? He, he did the right thing. He had the right motives. And I think that's what we can learn from this, pa this passage here, this chapter, is some things about what it takes to do right, okay? And doing right isn't always easy. Doing right is not always easy. 
look, if doing right was always easy, everybody would do it, right? <laughs> but it's not e always easy, so not everybody always does it. People always take shortcuts or do the wrong thing. <laughs> so go over to Psalms chapter 142. Psalms 142. I think David, you know, even, and it's kind of interesting, you know, his men are, you know, putting pressure on him, right? They're trying to get him to do the wrong thing. They, he has, he's experiencing peer pressure, right? Which is something a lot of us can probably relate to. You know, if you've ever, you know, gone through, you know, had friends, you know, that have tried to talk us into doing things we knew we shouldn't have done, there's often, you know, peer pressure. You know, you know what's wrong, you don't want to do it, but you don't want to be the kid or the person or whatever that, uh, you know, sticks out like a sore thumb. You want to fit in, you want to be like everybody else, you want to be accepted, right? And, and I'm not saying that David's men would have rejected him, but this is peer pressure. They're saying, hey, this is it. You know, and it says later that David had to withhold his men from killing Saul. They're like, let me do it if you don't want to do it, right? And look at Psalm 142. This is this other prayer. It says a prayer when David was in the cave. So this is his kind of insight to what he was thinking in this moment. And he says in verse 1, I cried in the Lord with my voice. With my voice in the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him my trouble. Verse 3, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me. So this isn't exactly a joyous moment for David. This isn't something he's just like, oh, I'm so thrilled. You know, God answered my prayer. He's saying, look, my spirit was overwhelmed. When thou knewest my path and the way wherein I walked, I have, they, they have privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Now, when did he write this? He wrote this in the cave. Who's in the cave with him? His 400 men. And he says, I looked on my right hand and beheld. There was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. And what I think he's kind of getting at here is saying, look, they're trying to talk me into doing something that would have probably gotten me killed, that God would have avenged Saul on me for. You know, would have gotten me into hot water, would have caused me to lose the kingdom, would have caused a civil war, would have, you know, 3,000 men would have diligently searched after me, you know, whatever. But he's saying, look, even in the midst of the cave and I'm with my 400 men, nobody is with you. Know, it's like he's all alone. He's feeling isolated in this passage, right? And why is that? Because, you know, doing right isn't always easy. And sometimes doing right is what's going to, be, is what's going to isolate you. When the peer pressure comes, when people are trying to talk you into doing something you shouldn't do, when you have to take a stand against family, against friends, against coworkers, we have to draw a line in the sand and say, no. Thus saith the Lord, or I'm not going to do that, or whatever it is. It comes in so many different shapes and forms. I don't have the time to go over and all the ways this can manifest in your life. But you have to understand that when you get tested and you know you have to make a decision and that you have to do the right thing, it just might be that that isolates you. It makes you feel overwhelmed. It makes you feel that there's no man with you. That even your own companions, those who you thought were on your side, don't even understand wh what it is you're supposed to do. They're the ones that are trying to get you to do something you shouldn't do. You know, and, and this is something that Paul is familiar with. The Apostle Paul, he told Timothy, you know, no man stood with me at the first, but all men forsook me. And he said, all them that be in Asia are turned away from me. You know, Paul, and, and what was his big sin? Preaching the gospel, you know, <laughs> preaching the word of God. And people didn't like it. They didn't like what he had to say. And they turned on him. Right? And this is something that you have to get used to in the Christian life, in life and just life in general. That if you're going to do the right thing, that might be exactly what isolates you. And we see here in this passage also, let's just kind of carry on here, but when David, he, he kind of he goes like, well, let me throw the guys a bone here. Right? I don't know why he didn't just say, you know what, I'm not, doing, I'm not touching the Lord's anointed, but then he goes and cuts off the robe. And he's like, well, technically it's not the anointed, it's the robe of the anointed. You know, but maybe he kind of had a plan here. Okay, and we'll see that play out. But he goes, and, he, and I don't think he did have a plan, but uh, and he, he goes to verse 4, and it says, uh, the end of verse 4, Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pay it pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And it wasn't because it was a nice robe. And he's like, man, this is Versace. You know, he sees the label on it. What a waste. You know, this was, you know, 3,000 shekels or something like that. Like, how many mules did he have to trade for this fine garment? That's not what smote him, right? It wasn't, you know, a waste of a, of a fashionable piece of clothing. It was because of the fact, like it says there in verse 6, And he said unto men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, 
the Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David, his own heart smites him. You know, he's smitten. You know, his heart breaks for the fact that he's, he's done this. And of course, let's just carry on here. And it says um, in verse 7, So David stayed his servants with these words. So he comes back with the, with the you know, with the, 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 the chunk of the robe. And they're like, you know, there's no blood on it, David. What's, what, are you, what are you doing? And he can explains, like, I'm not going to do this. You know, who knows? Maybe he even kind of went there with the intent to carry it out. But then he kind of came to his senses. You know, I'm just kind of hypothesizing. And then he kind of comes to his senses and he just cuts the robe off, comes back, and the guys are like, because uh, uh, then he says he has to stay his servants with these words. Like, we're not touching the Lord's anointed. We're not going to do this. We're not killing Saul. And, but it says, uh, he suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up and out of the cave, up out of the cave and went on his way. Look at verse 8. And David also arose afterward, and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So David comes out after him. And then, you know, David kind of lays into Saul. You know, verses 8 through 15 is basically David just letting Saul have it and putting him in his place. And let's just read that real quick, because this is, this is a really... Uh, there's some important things here. And it says in uh, verse 9, And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words? He's saying you're listening to liars, right? There, uh, there, none of these things they're saying, they're saying are true. Saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thy, uh, thine eyes have seen how the Lord hath delivered th the, thee to the uh, thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And maybe at this point, you know, Saul's thinking, well, he must, must have just seen my better qualities. You know, he must just understand what a waste it would have been to kill me, you know. But Saul, David goes on here and makes it perfectly clear that it wasn't because of, you know, Saul's upstanding character, you know, that he spared him. And he says, Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in mine hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see there is no neither evil nor transgression in mine hand. I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. So now he starts to really lay into him. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. And this is the one I think is really cuts right to the bone here on, on uh, Saul. As the proverb of the ancients, as the saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. So that's kind of like a, you know, backhanded way or just a very subtle way of, Saul, of David telling Saul, you're wicked and I'm not, right? That's the proverb, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, right? And he's saying, look, who's wicked here? If I were the evil one, I would have killed you, but you're the one who's hunting me down and I've done nothing wrong. Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. So he's kind of putting on Saul to examine his own heart. He says, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom hast thou dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. And it came to pass, when David had men and aid of speaking these words uh, to unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this the voice, is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. So David here just lays into him, right? And he just cuts right in. And everything he said is right. I mean, he told you his recap here, his recollection, his retelling of these events that are going on is right. Okay. And, and really, but what's really going on, I'm going to point this out, is that David is practicing a principle that his son Solomon would later express. Okay. And if you would, go over to Proverbs 21. Proverbs chapter 21. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 that a soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stirreth up anger. You know, and I wouldn't go so far as to say that David's answer was necessarily soft. But it kind of falls in line with, you know, a word fitly spoken. You know, how sweet it is. But he does have this principle that I think that maybe, maybe this is where Solomon got this. To thought to write this down. You know, I, I can't help but think that maybe David had some stories to tell his kids. I mean, when he grew up, when he was raising Solomon and he had little Solomon, he... He said, Dad, tell me a story. He's like, well, let me tell you about the time 
that Saul came into the cave and I didn't kill him. You know, and, 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 and what a story that would have been. But, and maybe that's where Solomon got this. Look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. Oh, I, I got the wrong reference here. The pro I'll just read it to you. The, the, the reference is this, is that uh, through, much, through much forbearance, through much forbearance, the, the prince is persuaded. That's the proverb. I've got the wrong reference written down. But that is the proverb. He says, through much forbearance, you know, patience, enduring, you know, putting up with things through forbearance, the prince is persuaded. And the prince is like the king, you know, the principal ruler, right? And that's where I think David, Solomon might have gotten that, is from that story. Because that's exactly what David has done here. He's been putting up with a lot through much forbearance. And even to the point where when Saul is delivered into his hand, when he's just handed to David on a silver platter, through much forbearance, the prince is persuaded. So then he, he, but he doesn't take it. You know, he forbears and he goes out and he gives this speech. And it's the speech, it's David's actions, it's David's words that change, that, that, that make an impact on Saul. But, you know, that just goes to show us that, you know, doing right isn't always easy. You know, doing right might be the very thing that isolates you from other people. But doing right also, you know, it's not easy, but it makes an impression, doesn't it? Sometimes somebody else will see somebody else doing right or hear about somebody else doing right. And it makes an impression on them. I mean, it certainly made a, it very well could have made an impression on Solomon to hear that story, to know about that story. Maybe even somebody else told him that story about, hey, let me tell you a story about your dad, King David. Let me tell you about the time that he forbear with Saul and, and, and persuaded Saul to go home. He didn't even have to lift up a sword, didn't have to, didn't have to shoot an arrow. He just went out and told him like it is, and he went home. And, Saul, and it made an impression on Solomon. And, you know, and the application is, you know, for probably primarily children, you know, parents to children. You know, we have, to fo we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing because what we're doing is making an impression on those around us, especially our kids. We want to make a good impression. And doing right is not always easy, but you know what? It makes an impression on our children. And you can apply that, you know, in any situation in life. Doing the right thing at work is, might not always be easy, but you know what? That very thing might be what makes an impression on somebody. Somebody might say, well, everybody else was taken. Everybody else was cheating off the clock, coming in late and leaving early and taking money out of the boss's pocket and taking stuff, you know, stealing or being lazy or being a slacker. But this guy over here, he did the right thing. And that might be the very thing that makes an impression on somebody that says, well, what's different about him? Or why is he not like the rest of us? So on and so forth. So David, you know, he's, he's, he's learning here the hard way, you know, that Doing the right thing isn't always easy, right? And, and we're kind of learning along with him, but we have to understand that it's important because it's the very thing that could make an impression on somebody. But David's being very patient, you know, his, through much forbearance, right? He's being very patient. And in the story, of course, his patience pays off, you know? He goes out there, he, he lets Saul have it. And it says in verse 16, and it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking, these words that Saul uh, unto Saul that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. I mean, it's hard to read that sometimes and not get a little misty to think about. Because remember, Saul, as bad as he is, it just goes to show you that there's some grain of goodness left in Saul. That there's still part of him that knows that, that he's not right with God. Okay? And he goes on and he basically just comes out and says it. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. Probably not the words David might have been expecting to hear. For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. You can see he's coming to his senses. He's per, you know, David's forbearance has persuaded the prince. He's coming to his senses here. He's having a moment of clarity. And thou hast shown me this day how much thou hast, uh, how that, that thou hast dealt well with me, for as much when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, and thou killest me not. I mean, here's... Here's Saul, the same guy who a ch pre chapter previous had said, you know, he, God has delivered him into mine hand. And then he gets this wake-up call in chapter 24, where he, and, he realized, and, he's, and, he, and he comes to this conclusion that, look, the Lord has delivered me, has, uh, the, me into thine hand. And David, or Saul rather, is coming to his senses. He says, thou killest me not. Verse 19, for if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore, the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now behold, and these are very profound words, okay? And we'll get into it in a minute. 
I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. I remember I was, you know, I, I'll, I'll read it and I'll listen to it, you know, in, my, in the van, you know, when I'm driving around. And, and, and the, 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 bio, the, the app read that verse. And I'm just thinking, and I even think I said it out loud. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing, Saul? Like, doesn't that just make you want to just be like, ah, what are you doing? He says, I know that thou shalt surely be king and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. He's admitting it. It's in like, well, what are you doing then? Why don't you turn over the reins? Why don't you step down? Right? But he's just so stubborn. And he goes on, Swear now un therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me and thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. So this is really... He, I mean, he's, he's just coming clean with David. I mean, he's telling him exactly what we all know. He's admitting it. And then he's expressing his true fears here. What he's really afraid of is the fact that David's just going to wipe out everybody. That he's going to get in the throne and just everyone's gone. And it says there, he, so he, he says, Swear not that you, swear now therefore unto me that, that you won't do this, right? In verse 22, And David swear unto Saul. And Saul went home. And David went and get man and his man got them up under the hold. So David is a, he, he says that sounds nice, Saul, and I'll go ahead and swear that to you. But he's learned by experience that this ain't over yet. And he goes back to the hold and he says, "Well, I know Saul better than that. It's you know show up one day, play the play the instrument for him, and you know chase off the evil spirit, and then it's the next day get a spear thrown at you. You know that's how Saul is. You know he's he's loving you one day and then he's completely mad the next day." So he's not, he, he's, he's remained cautious here at the end, right? But his patience pays off, right? His patience is crying out to the Lord, his willingness to do the right thing, to not be pressured into doing the wrong thing. It pays off. Saul comes to his senses and leaves off pursuing him. So David gets, you know, some respite. He gets a breather. He gets to take a chance to kind of regroup. And I believe it was the, ver the, the verses 12 and 13 that especially gave Saul pause, you know, where he talked about the wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, you know, the Lord's going to judge between me and you. I think those were really uh, the dagger that he drove home there. But, and, and Saul comes to his senses, but, you know, and he, and he goes on, just admits all the truth. And what's really interesting is in verse 20, he said that what he says in verse 20 really gives you, you have to really think about the context of where he's saying this, okay? He's spilling the beans, right? He's just coming out and admitting all the truth, right? But he does. You have to ask yourself. Let's read verse twenty. And now, behold, I know that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Do you think he's saying this in the audience of three thousand men? Do you think he's saying that in the ears of three thousand guys that you know he's been chasing David with, for, that he's been chasing David with for who knows how long? I mean, chapter twenty-three. It says he sought him every day, but could not. You know, he couldn't catch him. And then the Philistines, and then he has to take these guys, grab his army, and go run off the Philistines. And now the Philistines are gone. And it says in the, in the beginning of this chapter that it's 3,000 chosen men. It's not the entire army. He gets done fighting the Philistines. They're chasing David. They go fight the Philistines. He gets done with that. And he goes, you 3,000 guys, come with me. We're going to go back and chase David some more. The rest of you can go home. I mean, if you were one of these 3,000 guys, and you're getting drugged through the woods for just months. You're going to fight in these battles. And would you want to hear that? That's pretty demoralizing. And if you're Saul, would you be that stupid to say something that, like that in front of 3,000 men? I don't think so. So my opinion is that he's saying this and his 3,000 men aren't even there, which is interesting because that kind of gives you a better understanding of what's taking place in the story. <laughs> See, Saul, again, he's been so confident and he's allowed himself to become careless and to become isolated. I believe this whole story plays out. David's got him right there. Even, even after the cave, he comes out of the cave. He says he came up after him. And he could have still taken David, Saul. I don't think Saul's going to... And this is my opinion, and people can disagree. However, I do have two pastors and one layman that I know are on my side. And you can go ahead and disagree if you want. But that's how I read it. You know, and again, like I said earlier, I think God doesn't exactly just explicitly give us all the details. He kind of gives us enough to form what's going on here because that's what good literature does you know and the bible's thick enough he doesn't have to want to sit here and, and, and you know explain every little minutia here 
We can get the sense of things just because we know that that would be a very dumb thing for a king to say in front of 3,000 chosen men who were probably getting pretty war weary. <clears throat> Not only that, but, you know, David's timing to confront him. When did that take place? Saul rises up out of the cave and David comes right up after him. So, there's, you know, get the picture. It's kind of like Saul shows up at the sheep coats, notices the cave, says, everybody take a break. I'm going to go up to the cave and, and, and you know, do what I got to do. He's kind of isolated. He's probably a short walk away. Maybe he's within yelling distance. I don't know. But he's close enough to where David, or he's far enough away to where David feels confident to come out and confront him. You say, well, you know, he confronted him later. Remember when he went and took the spear and his, uh, I don't know if it was buckler or was it, I can't remember what it was. I know he at least took his saw spear. Remember they snuck into the camp and took it. And then he calls out and he's, and he's in front of, and you know all of his men are there. But it says in that instance that he's a great way off, right? There, he's like yelling from a distance, and he's probably like has a precipice. He has, you know, the high ground. He has the advantage in this instance. <laughs> when he has the advantage here, but, you know, not, you know, not to get away, but because he could take Saul if he wanted to. And I think he's just got Saul right where he wants him. And, you know, you see that in the timing where he comes to confront him. You don't come out and confront the guy who's hunting you with 3,000 men when they're right there. And you go, and they're like, there he is, you know, and it's just like, turns into the Jerry Springer show or something. Everyone just, you know, goes after him. There's no stopping him. They're like, we want to go home. If it takes killing David, that's what we're going to do. I don't even know if Saul could, could stop those guys at that point. Maybe they could have. But you could even see it, you know, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Saul's own words. I mean, Saul says, you know, and I know he could, you could say, well, he's just referring to the time, the moment he just had in the cave. He's seeing the, the robe. And, he, and he's coming to Saul's senses. You know, he's, he's realizing he could have di died. He said uh, in verse 18, Thou hast showed me this day how much thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me in thy hand, and thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, would he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for thou hast done to, unto me this day. You could say, well, he's talking about the fact he let him out of the cave. You know, and maybe. But you could also, you know, read, you know, consider these other things that I'm, I'm bringing up. <coughs> you know, Saul's own words, Saul's own actions. In verse 22, and David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. So I think the way this plays out for me is that Saul, you know, they, he, 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 you know he realizes David could have killed him in there. David still has the opportunity to kill him now while he's speaking to him. And then he goes back to his men and says, and I don't think, he, I don't, to me, he wouldn't bring up any of this. He would just be like, Let's go home. You know, uh, something came up, you know, or, hey, you know, turns out he's not there. Somebody came. You know, he could have said anything. I don't think he goes back and says, yeah, David was just up in the cave over there and almost killed me. And they'd be like, well, let's go get him. Right. They would be then they would where he is. And he goes home. And of course, that's all because, again, because David, you know, did the right thing, even when it was hard. You know, he didn't touch the Lord's anointing. He was patient and it paid off. Right. It paid off. And, you know, say, well, what's the point? I mean, well, who cares about all those details? You know, what's the practical application of even trying to, you know, figure out was Saul alone, was he not alone? Well, I think he was alone, and the point is this, that doing right works. That's the point, is that doing right works. And it works really good to the point where, you know, you can just drive off your enemy by going out and just telling them off. It works. Doing right works. But does that mean it's always easy? No. You know, it, it, it's going to isolate you. People are going to be thinking, well, you're weird. You're <laughs> Why don't you do what everybody else is doing? How come you don't act like us and do what we're doing? Well, you know, it's because I'm trying to do the right thing. And you have to understand it works. It makes an impression. But I want you also to understand this, is that, you know, doing right isn't always going to produce the outcome you want. You know, we don't do right just so we can get the desired outcome. Because the resolution in the story is all wrong, isn't it? Like I already mentioned here. He says in verse 21, or excuse me, in verse 20, I know thou shalt surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Oh, okay, so you're ready to sign it over then. Well, let's get that crown off your head. That would be the, the ideal resolution, right? And he's brought Saul to his senses. He's admitting everything. No, even when you do right, that doesn't mean that you're going to get the guaranteed outcome. Because again, we know it says there at the end that David swearing to Saul and Saul went home to Gibeah. You know, he went and, you know, shaved and took a bath, had a hot meal, slept in his own bed. 
And David and his men got them up into the hold and thought, well, that must be nice. It must be nice to be able to just, you know, agree with everything I just said and, and continue on your merry way. So the point is this, is that, you know, the resolution here is wrong. You know, if David's meant to be king and Saul knows it, then why not make him king? Why not give him what's inevitable? Saul here, you know, it, it, this is, and this is the difference between people, right? Between Saul and David, this is kind of the difference between people. People who know what's right, people who know what's right, in fact, they even know what to say. They even know, they can even tell you what's right. Saul knows what's right. Saul said what was right. But did he do what was right? No. And why is that? Because that was too hard for him. It would have been too hard. It would have been too much, you know, it would have cost him too much pride. It would have been have him have to eat too much crow to do the right thing and admit that he was wrong. You know, and, and a lot of people, that's what they struggle with a lot. It's just being able to, you know, just the ability to be able to admit you're wrong is so hard for so many people. And if I'm telling you, if you can do that in life, if you can do it learn, when somebody calls you in the carpet or someone just even just gently comes to you and says, hey, you messed up. You made a mistake. And if you can learn to say, yeah, you're right. I was wrong. And take that, man, sky's the limit for you. Sky is the limit. You're going to be able to go so far in life because a lot of people can't do that. They know it's right. Oh, yeah, yep, you're right. I did make a mistake. I messed everything up. Yep, David is supposed to be king and not me. But now I'm going to go home because doing what's right is hard. <clears throat> saying what's right is pretty easy if you know what's right. He wasn't, Saul was not willing to pay the price. But I want to say that, you say, well, then I don't know if, if I, what's, what's the point in doing right then? You're just telling me tonight that doing right is not always easy. You're telling me that it's hard, that it's going to get me isolated, that people are going to you know, think I'm weird for being the guy that wants to do the right thing on the job site or whatever. You're telling me, why, you know, why should I be right? Why would I want to do the right thing? It's not even going to turn out in my favor. Even if I do right, things still might go wrong. Why should I bother doing right if doing right isn't easy? Because of this, because of the fact, and if you would go over to Romans chapter 12, and we'll close there, that doing right is rewarding. Doing right is rewarding. You know, David might not have gone home to his own bed and had a nice, comfortable night's sleep. You know, he might have had to go up there with a bunch of 400 stinky dudes and hang out in the woods for another who knows how long with no end in sight. You know what? But I bet when he went to bed last night, that night, rather, he, he was able to, to sleep pretty sweetly because of the fact he knew that he did what was right. That's a good feeling. To not have it a look over your shoulder, to have a clear conscience, to know that when you go into some trial or temptation, when you're tempted to do wrong and you don't do it, you do the right thing. At the time, it does, it's not always easy. At the time... You know, you might get made fun of. You might have the peer pressure. You know, and it might not even, the, the situation might not turn around. But if you come out clean, that's a good feeling. That is rewarding. Doing right is rewarding. That's why you should be willing to do the right thing even when it's hard. <clears throat> Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. It says there, we all know this verse, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's exactly what David did in this story. He was not overcome by evil. He didn't give in to the temptation to slay Saul, even when it was handed to him on a silver platter. He didn't, you know, heed to his men's pressure. He, in fact, he stayed them back. And even when he, you know, went out and heard Saul say all the right things, he didn't insist that Saul follow through. He didn't say, well, I'm glad you see things my way. Why don't you come over here and we're going to go, well, all of us are going to go down and you can tell your 3,000 men what you just told me. You know, he didn't, wasn't overcome by that. He let God work. He let God work things out and validate him in the long run. And it was a long run for David. But what did he do? He overcame evil with good. He did what was right even when it was hard. Let's go ahead and pray.